Leaders, and thank you for joining Inmates for Change. My name is Jones. I am the founder, CEO of the 501c3 non-for-profit Inmates for Change. We are dedicated to breaking the bondage of destructive thinking. As I have mentioned in previous shows, <clears throat> excuse me, when I first came home as a returning citizen, I found it extremely difficult to secure gainful employment. And barring that, I have 27 years sales experience, professional sales experience, I should say, 17 years managerial experience. I ran my own business, home improvements and remodeling, for 14 years, and I worked the same position as a cable installation tech for 10 years. Coming home from prison at the age of 55, I was not able to secure gainful employment, not during the first year of my release, which made it pretty tough and, and challenging for an individual at my age to reintegrate back into community and society. So what I want to do is not only give you all a chance to hear and understand some of the challenges as well as obstacles and the few rewards that happen through reentry, I want to take a moment and introduce my guest, Mr. Ray Robinson. Ray and I work in the industry as associates, cohorts, and in ca on some cases partners in projects that are along the lines of reentry services and resources that we provide to returning citizens and individuals who have felony convictions. So, Mr. Ray, I'd like to say thank you first for coming in. Thank you for having me. My, my brother. My brother. Before we get started, let me let you guys know that those of us who are going to join this conversation today, we are at 312-738-1060. Again, 312-738-1060. So, Ray, if you don't mind starting with opening up the show, why don't you give us some background about yourself, and then we can move into maybe some questions. Yeah, um, right now I'm employed a non-for-profit uh, place of employment. Um, I also do a lot of community outreach work within the community. I'm also on a MacArthur committee here in the county, and I represent the community dealing with issues as far as recidivism, mental illness, substance abuse, and poverty issues. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Are you a formerly incarcerated individual? Uh, yes, I am. Yes, what, I am. Can you expand on that a little bit for us? Maybe tell us what's going on with that? Yeah. Um, you don't yeah. have to list your charges or anything okay, like yeah, that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, how long you've been home? And... Uh, I've been home now for a little bit, uh, close to three years. Okay. Yeah, and um, uh, the transition for uh, coming home, leaving prison, it was a certain amount of individual things I had to do within myself as uh, trying to understand the process and face the challenges that I will be confronted with once I re-enter society. Uh, but the pre-release process for me was the most awakening period for me, dealing with my psychological state and how I perceived the challenges that I will be confronted with when I enter society. Did y'all get that? <laughs> Ray, you're so scientific, my brother. It's the fact. It, it, it's, 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 it's the obvious facts. Okay, okay. Now, this is a serious situation, and you know something? I've got a couple of questions here that I wanted to pose to you, but you kind of tapped on two of the questions already <laughs> before I even got started. That's why I'm looking at you like that. I'm going to give us a chance to uh, get our name out there and let people understand what's going on with us. We are inmates for change. We can be reached during the daytime between 9.30 a.m. and 3.30 p.m., Monday through Friday at 773-746-3075. You can visit our website at inmatesforchange.org or take a chance and give us an email. You'd be amazed at how quickly we get back to you. Inmatesforchange at gmail.com. We're going to get right back to what we're speaking with. We're talking with Mr. Ray Robinson. Ray, I'm going to hit you with a couple of questions that sure. I have prepared. and Some of these might even take you by surprise, but... What are some of the perceived challenges you had to face while re-entering society? Well, uh, the fear of change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, here's a guy that gets out of prison, having been employed in over 20 years. Now I have a new opportunity for employment. And it's a fear of that. Um, far as being responsible, uh, being independent. How do I approach this? How do I re-enter society that I never felt a part of? Uh, and I had to really have an inspection 
Um, the truth is, jail had became a dark gift for me because it forced me to look at what was important. And I had to utilize my time to see how can I re-enter society as a, a law-abiding citizen. And also, how can I make a positive adjustment and deal with being independent, look for employment, and deal with the difficulties of that process. I can imagine that was a tough go all the way through. And you mentioned earlier about pre-release and the preparation that it took for you to put those tools in your box as you were moving toward re-entering society after release. So my second question here would be, psychologically, how did you prepare yourself? Wow, I had to uh, have an inspection. Hmm. And, and um, this inspection, took, I had to really concede to my most inner self who I am and what do I want to achieve and how can I accomplish that goal. Okay. Uh, because the individual responsibility is on the individual and change is an individual decision that I had to make. You know, I, oh, the previous shows I spoke about how you have to believe to achieve. So I know for me personally, I went through the same set of circumstances that you had to go through with my re-entering as well as my pre-release. Going to prison at the age of 53 hmm. and then sitting down for two and a half years and being prepared to come out, there was a lot of stuff that I didn't even know was going to be part of it. I kind of figured that because I had paid my debt to society, <laughs> and I had successfully completed my probation and my parole <laughs> requirements, yeah. that someone would say, you know something, you, you look pretty good, you're, you're nice and you're cleaned up now, and, you know, come on aboard, come on aboard. But I ran into they have this written law now with private industry where because of my background, I couldn't be hired. So this discriminatory type practice is prevalent especially along the lines of reentry and uh, offenders who have felony convictions and are still in the community. So we're looking around and we're seeing all this prosperity that's happening around us, and we're looking at how do we get in? So we're still kind of like in prison, you know, and this leads up to the third kind of question I have here, which is what kind of programs or organizations help to ease your transition? Yeah, uh, the Alumni Association was one program, and also Inmates for Change, which, of course, uh, you introduced me to, and I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, and uh, um, they was very influential and very inspiring, and they gave me the necessary information and the tools to make this transition, such as the one I have made. Okay. And how? let me just ask, this is a personal question. This is off the, off the script as well. How's the family support connection working? Uh, how, did you, how did you get it back? Excellent. Um, here's the thing. When you have a, a long history uh, of a negative behavior relationship to your family, and when you first re-enter and you start making changes, you start seeing changes, but it's still a doubt there. Mm -hmm. Whether well, they see this behavior, this consistent, consistent positive behavior taking place, then they start bowing off into that truth. They're no longer looking at you as an old person and they're embracing this new person. That's what I found as well. And, you know, let me tell you, when I came in, I, uh, when I came home, I had a challenge where you know, I had brought some shame to the family, you know, of course, because we had all been educated and this kind of thing. We had a strong mother and a supportive community. And my sister, finally after about a year and a half, she said to me, you know, I'm proud of you. And, man, that put a lump in my throat as big as my fist, right. man, you know, because, you know, you love your family members, man. But to hear the member of your family reach out and say to you that, I'm proud of you, yeah. is that's when you know that you're doing the right thing for the right reason, and it's not about this big showcase kind of thing. You know, it's a humbling experience. Yeah. Did you in encounter that type of yeah, thing um, as well? Um, I think one of the most uh, powerful things my father had said to me, which was twofold, when I came home from prison, he told me I stole his sleep. He said all that time I was in prison, he couldn't sleep. Mm. And then the next powerful, I'm talking about most inspiring thing my father said was that he's proud I'm his son. Isn't that something? That's something. Those of you who would like to call in and either contribute a contribution of a comment or a question, we're at 312-738-1060. 312-738-1060. While we're waiting for the call, Ray, this is very interesting with this conversation, and I'm learning some stuff right now <laughs> as we go because, you know, I've been knowing you for a number of years, and yeah. 
you know, I don't even think we had a chance to really sit down and discuss some of the challenges that we overcame. All we knew is that we were in the same rooms at the same time with some of these people who are moving and shaking and trying to make some uh, headway through the legislation, through the community activism, the outreach and stuff like that. Go ahead. I thought you were about to say something because you were giving me a posture that you were about to say. So let me just ask now, in your opinion, how can the formerly incarcerated individual help change public policy? Uh, um, I would say getting involved with any organization or any uh, kind of entity that addresses that issue and wants to really affect change and to support it and, and, and to uh, let the community hear their voice, let legislators and the policymakers hear their voice and show their sincerity and determination to affect change because it's the policies that's in place. It's the laws that are in place that is hindering a lot of the processes that can take place for the formerly incarcerated. Mm. I guess you heard that from the horse's mouth right now. Right now, we've got a caller on the line. Caller, who are you, please? Caller? Yes, sir. Speak up just a little bit for me. Joe, this is Ray. Hey, Ray, what's going on? Oh, okay, fine. Hey, Ray, I've got Ray online, and How I've got doing, Ray, Ray in the studio. <laughs> you don't mind me calling you Joe, do you? Who, Jones? No. Or Ray? Uh, you, Ray. I'm Ray. Yeah, so is the, so is my guest. My guest name my guest name is Ray. Okay, you know what? Uh, listen, I got a comment and a quick question. The comment is this: with all the laws, bad laws against Hispanics and African Americans, why do we keep on going and getting that third strike, knowing that we already have three strikes against us? So you know what I mean. And, I do. And one, other, and one other thing is, do you think that if somebody shoots somebody and paralyzes them for the rest of their life and he gets 10 or 15 years, do you think he, do you think that he's created his gift to society? That man, that man, that man in the wheelchair hasn't, you know, didn't do anything and, and he's in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Thank you. Now, that's a great question, Ray. And I'm going to ask you, Ray, did you want to field the question or did you want to take the first one that he offered? Because the second question is a morality question. It's about an individual who uh, performed an act of violence against someone and left them paralyzed for the rest of their life. Should that individual who went and done a short, short term or however extended period of time he was in prison, should he still have to do some type of payment or retribution back to the individual or his family as a result of Riding that individual of use of his limbs. Yeah, uh, I think it's a it's a, a program or process right now where ex offenders, I would say, uh, the uh, formerly incarcerated, get to meet the victims of their crime and try to uh, make some type of amends. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I want to uh, kind of touch on your first question. On first one, yeah. um, when uh, you know, we we have to understand the mind that's making these decisions, far as. Uh, for, you know, the offender. Um, until there's a deep internal change, there will be no external change. Despite how many times a person goes to prison, uh, look for resources in prison to help them change, until they make an internal decision to change and then start putting in the work, that would solidify an uh, internal and an external change as opposed to a person going back and forth to prison, getting involved in prison programs, but not making that conscious decision to change from within. Now, that is profound because I, <laughs> let me just tell you this, my next question is the same thing. So I'm going to just say this question, but you don't <laughs> have to answer it because you already have. But on, on your question, Ray, in all seriousness of uh, my Previous shows, I mentioned first breaking the cycle. You have to decide that the cycle can be broken. Then you have to also believe it. Second side of that is the addictive thinking brain that finds the compulsion to go back into a life of crime knowing that this third strike is hanging over his head. And should he get caught, that he will end up probably spending the rest of his life inside prison, that individual has a situation that the addiction, with the disease of it that works as a self-destructive nature, down in your subconscious, this releases this compulsion that the individual does not know how to overcome the urge or the impulse 
to go back into that. He may be suffering some emotional situation where there's not enough money in the house. His girl is telling him that he needs to get out and earn, and, but he can't find work because the jobs that he's been trying to get, they have been uh, barred from him because of his convictions. And the policy in those companies says that we can't hire convicted felons. Now, this is part of what the reentry services and resources are about outside. This is what we're doing, and this is why Inmates for Change came to life, because there's so much unfairness going on out in our communities, and especially against convicted felons. There are human rights issues that are involved here, not necessarily victims' rights personally or exclusively, but there are uh, individual rights being done, uh, harm to. So we, we want to come across the line of trying to, our format with Inmates for Change is what we want to do is discuss the possibility of the ex-offender population becoming a protected class. And in future shows, I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by way of guests and information that we provide over here. Now, getting back to what we were just explaining, explaining uh, Ray, what would you consider to be the responsibility of the formerly incarcerated individual upon reentry? And you just answered that question, but if you got more oh, forward, yeah, go yeah. right he, in on it. A, a conscious decision has to be made. Okay. Um, and that decision had to come from within the individual. Despite the challenges, the external challenges that one faced, one have to be dedicated and determined to consistently work with change. Absolutely. And, and we cannot ignore the truth or the reality which one is confronted with, but where there is a will, there is a way. Mm -hmm. You seek out the information, you seek out the resources, you seek out the program, you seek out the people that can help you nourish this transition, and also programs that can help you in the process during this transition. And also, we have to look at economic opportunities that can help propagate a positive change. Now, with that, what I'm hearing, and I'm going to break it down a little bit more, not that my audience is not that educated enough to receive it, but I just want to make it extremely crystal clear that you've got to get active in activating your life. You can't just sit around and let osmosis take place where you think it's going to change because all of a sudden you're a good guy. <laughs> you know, we've got a lot of stuff against us. Well, there's a racial bias. There's a gender bias. There's an education bias. There's a part of the geographic landscape that you live in bias. There's budget biases. <laughs> you know, it, it, the list just goes on. So what I want to do is give you all a chance again for to call in and give us some parts of whatever it is that you're thinking or feeling at 312-738-1060. Again, 312-738-1060. We would love for you to enjoy uh, coming in and contributing to the conversation, but we also want to offer you an opportunity to email us at inmatesforchange at gmail, or you can go to our website, inmatesforchange.org, and if you decide to pick up your phone between the hours of 9.30 a.m. and 3.30 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday, you can reach us at 773-746-3075. Ray, what I wanted to do, I've got just a couple more questions for you, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. What activities have you been involved in since your release? Well, um, right now, um, I'm an outreach coordinator for the Alumni Association. I okay. help out the community. Um, I, do, I do work with First Defense Legal Aid, um, educating the community in the 4th, 5th, the six uh, rights on how to defend them and exercise them. And also, um, I do a lot of mentoring. I hold a lot of winter circles, groups, at uh, recovery homes. And I'm always available to help. I also uh, deal with youth in the community, at-risk youth. I know Ounce Prevention has been a ton of cure, so we try to reach the youth before they start entering the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's amazing stuff, and I'm proud to hear it, man. I'm glad to know you because we need more Ray Robinsons out there in the world. We need more Joneses trying to help get this pain out of our communities as well as part of the world that we live in. You know, this situation that we have either bought into a condition where we have born into it or we have created with our own hands, this thing can be broken. We can break the bondage of this destructive thinking. We've just got to be shown the way. And for those of us, you mentioned outreach. So with your outreach, and, and tell for my audience in just a couple of seconds, or not a couple of seconds, but a couple of minutes, what exactly does outreach entail? What do you do as an outreach advocate? Well, number one, um, 
for the formula, you know, those that are re-entering re it, the community, mm -hmm. and also those that have been through the criminal justice system. And what we do is we support them, we communicate with them, and we get them, we help them to connect them to the proper resources that can help them in their process. Okay, yeah. that's great. That's great work, man, and thank you again. We've got a caller on the line. Caller, give us your name and tell us uh, what it is that you want to contribute, question or comment. I can't hear you. Hello. Hi. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know too much about the show. Am I supposed to be talking about what, it, you know, what the question is and what the problem is? Your question. I, I was hoping that you had heard what you were listening to over the course of the show, and you may have a just, question. I just or, got on. I just got on the show for the first time watching it for about a minute. A minute. Okay. That, that, what, yeah. what we're talking about today is the challenges and the adversities that an individual goes through along the lines of his re-entry. Guy coming home from prison or a young lady right, coming right. home from prison right, and right. or one who's in the community already and suffering that because of their conviction or their background, they can't get gainful employment. Okay, so uh, I'm the voice of, I'm really the voice of GED or high school equivalency in the country. Okay. Okay, and um, it was my goal as around 2002 to just mobilize entire communities and not just a classroom with 15, 20, or 25 people. As a quick example, uh, I met with one of the top people in labor in New York City. I did a big favor from in Puerto Rico, and we were gonna mobilize 300 people in each borough of New York City each week so that people could come in and get help instead of just setting up a, a small classroom with 15 or 20 people and saying you're shut out, you have to wait till September or some other date. Okay, let me, let me suggest this for you because yeah. that sounds like what we need to be discussing uh, coming up in another show, but also if you've got a pen handy, I'm gonna click right over to uh, our contact information, 773-746-3075. Call that number between 9.30 a.m. and 3.30 p.m., Monday through Friday, and one of the representatives will be more than happy to get your contact information so that we can establish a dialogue on that. Let me have the number one more time. 773-746-3075. Yeah. Seven, Save the last four numbers again. 3075. Okay, I got you. Thanks so much. All right, and thanks so much for your question and your Real contribution. Pleasure. Real pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. That's some good work that he's doing out there also. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I believe that all effort, no matter how small, you know, there's an old uh, uh, parable story where there's a seashore of starfish that are all washed up on the shore from high tide the night before, and now this low tide has taken place, and these starfish can't get off the beach and the blazing sun is killing them. So there's a gentleman that's running down and he's just throwing these starfish in as fast as he can, you know, as many as he can throw in. And this little boy is way down the pier type of the seashore looking at him. And as he makes his way down towards this boy, he says, the little boy says to him, he says, man, mister, you know, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm trying to help save some of these starfish. He says, but there's so many of them, you know, there's hundreds of miles of, of seashore <laughs> these things. He said, what difference can you make? And the man looked at him as he was throwing the last starfish in I, just at that point, and he looked at me and said, it made all the difference in the world to the starfish I just threw Absolutely. back into that water. Absolutely. So that's the thing that we're saying with the caller who just called in with the GED program. If you can get 15 of them in the room uh, for the GED, that's 15 that don't have to be out there on the street. Those, of those 15, that word is going to get through those, their peer group, and there's going to be 15 to 20 more. What I want to do in the last part of this questioning, uh, Ray, if you don't mind, is how has the IFC, the Inmates for Change organization, been involved with you and your transition through reentry? Wow. Uh, I could tell a variety of stories on how influential Inmates for Change I've been. But I want to take it back to uh, being in your class. Okay. Um, and one, you know, there's a lot of things that stuck out, but I think the most impacting thing was we know that knowledge of the problem is key to the solution. And what you always focus on was once we identified the problem to try to live in the solution. Absolutely. And that was great information. Um, and I, I applied that and I adopted that. Inmates for Change in the Insight 
and understanding how the inmate, my, how the from the incarcerated mind actually operate. And you also talk us about responsibility of thought. Okay. Uh, dealing with our psychological state, how uh, our reference frame of how we see the world and see ourselves. And that was just great information. As a matter of fact, it was life-changing information. Well, thank you for coming on board. We're going to hopefully have you back in again. I'd like to say that this program has been made possible in part by support from the Mobile Doc. Mr. Ray Robinson is my guest tonight on Inmates for Change, and we want to truly thank you for tuning in. Those of you who called in, thank you so much for your contribution and your questions. And keep us in your mind when you decide to ask about reentry or reentry services. Thank you and enjoy yourself.